I am your host of Across Generations, Tiffany D. Cross, and this is the only place where you will hear three different perspectives from three distinct generations of Black women, and I'm so thrilled to invite you to this conversation. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Across Generations. I missed you guys. Listen, I know a lot of you guys were looking for us. Our queue was empty, but we are back. We have to take time to actually tape these episodes. And so we are so happy to return to you. And I just want to thank you all for the wonderful feedback we've gotten. One, I'm so happy y'all were looking for me because I definitely miss being here with you all every week. But I was at Essence Fest. I was at the DNC. I was all over the country. I did speaking engagements in Cincinnati, Los Angeles, Nevada, everywhere. And people constantly told me I love across generations. I love hearing the conversations with elder women, younger women, and you. So I really thank you all for rocking with me because this was a heartfelt project. I think uh, as black women, we are so busy working so hard and pouring ourselves into this democracy, into this country, into our families, that sometimes we forget our own humanity. And I wanted to create a safe space where we could breathe and exhale and be ourselves and exchange in a healthy uh, debate or ideology or just comfort and learning and understanding. And I know it has really fed my soul and my spirit to have these conversations each week. And it just makes my heart warm and expand to hear that you all have shared in that experience with me. So we plan to keep bringing you these episodes each week. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what topics you want us to discuss and discover. I'm learning um, as I go about so many things. We're coming up on a lot of shows where my eyes are opened um, to a lot of things. We're going to have a show on sexual fluidity. We're going to revisit church topics. You guys had a lot to say about that. So we're going to talk about church hurt. That's people who've been hurt in church. Uh, we're going to talk about online dating. A lot of you guys have been texting us and DMing us and telling us what you want us to talk about. So those are just a few of the topics that will be coming up. We're going to talk about women in sports. Um, we've seen that change and take shape over the past uh, few years. And quite frankly, as the country shifts, we're about to be led by a black woman president. I declare it so. I speak it into existence. And so we want to center our humanity and our politics, quite frankly, as we continue to define the priorities of this country. So we have a lot to talk about uh, coming up on this half of the season. But before we get into all that, I really just wanted to take time to connect with you guys and answer some of the questions that you've asked our producers, that you DM me personally, or DMs are at Across Generations handle. So let's get into it. So one of the questions uh, that a lot of you ask is, Tiffany, where are you? Where have you been? So a lot of you get to hear me uh, each week on Native Land Pod, but I was also traveling all over the country. So if you watch that, then you know I was at the DNC in Chicago this year. And I have to say, watching one of our own take that stage, it was just a wonderful experience to be part of. Many of you uh, may be familiar with Win with Black Women, this wonderful organization um, helmed by Joseka Eady. Maybe one of you were, some of you were among the 44,000 people who were on that initial call to help uh, raise money and funds for Vice President Harris. And so connecting with those women in real life and being surrounded by my sisters as a black woman is poised to lead this country for the first time. It was such an amazing spiritual experience for me. We, I'm so just enthralled with black women. The way that we continue to show up despite all of our hurt, all of our pain, despite everything this country has done to us, how we show up every time and save America from herself. It was so great to have my spirit uh, elevated. It felt like before that there was this collective depression, quite honestly, you know, this failing democracy and you know, we were being attacked on every front. And so it really did collectively lift a lot of our spirits. But listen, revolutions are messy, right? And so one of the things that I uh, noticed at the DNC, it was a lot of protest uh, surrounding the DNC about what's happening uh, in Gaza um, and, and Israel's uh, war with Hamas. And so there was a night where I stopped and I stood there because I wanted to hear their protest and hearing these uh, protesters read the names, the many, many names, over 40,000 deaths at this point, 
these particular protesters just focused on the children uh, who had been killed by the IDF in Gaza. I have to say it was so heartbreaking. And so as a black woman, I'm torn because I'm in this celebratory mode after our own oppression, our own violence and hostile oppression here to see someone who looks like me take the helm of a country that is also funding something that I morally cannot support across uh, the sea in, in Gaza, in Middle East. It was just, uh, it's the duality of our kind. It's, it's a, a terrain that, that we have to navigate. And so as we bear witness and participate in this revolution, I am perfectly prepared to um, hold our leaders accountable and always be on the right side of history, but also stand in goodness and righteousness and do what's right. So seeing that juxtaposition at the DNC, I have to say it did bring me pause and it probably brings a lot of you pause out there. I am still supporting uh, Vice President Harris. Uh, I'm, I've taken to calling her President-elect Harris because I am committed that it will happen. Yet we do um, have to hold this administration accountable for how we show up here when it comes to domestic policy and most certainly when it comes to our foreign policy. So I'm an enthusiastic voter uh, this November. I hope many of you are as well, uh, but we don't plan on being quiet um about what's what's good and what's right and i'm i take note of a lot of things happening across i don't want you all to think that because i heard the protesters on what's happening um in, in gaza that i'm not uh as empathetic and, and connected to what's happening in sudan um or what's happening in nigeria and what's happening in kenya there are plenty of um hotbeds of strife and discord uh, on the continent where our ancestors are from, and I take a deep vested interest in that as well. So a lot happening in the globe. So this is why this space is so important to me because we do deserve those moments where we can just come together and lock arms and hold hands and chain a soul just to connect with each other and remember our own humanity. So. Thank you for being curious about what I've been doing, uh, but that's just some of the things that I've been doing and the DNC was definitely a highlight from the summer. I do want to talk about something else though because I, we weren't on the air and I didn't get the chance to talk about this with you guys and that is the debate. I know it's a few weeks after the debate, but if you're like me, you may still be riding high. Um, you know, m when Michelle Obama, our forever floatist, forever floatist Michelle Obama spoke at the DNC and you know, we saw the contrast between where she was at one point when she said, you know, when when they go low, we go high. And I think this year she came out and said, F that, I got something to say. And it just energized us in such a way. And you saw that same energy with Vice President Harris when she took that stage, marched across uh, that stage and shook uh, Donald Trump's hand and looked him in the eye like a black woman can and said, let's have a good debate. She immediately took control as the adult that she is. And one thing that I found so incredibly I guess frustrating, but also so very American, is that this incredibly accomplished woman was on the stage opposite this ill-equipped, politically inept man. She has never lost an election. She is one of the most qualified candidates that we have ever had for president of the United States. And she's sitting across from a former reality TV star and failed businessman with not one, not two, but three baby mamas. Now ask me how we might be looking at this black woman had those roles been reversed. If she had three baby daddies out there, if she had declared bankruptcy, if she had multiple failures in her business, had she made racist comments about white people, she would not get to have footing on that stage. Yet you saw these two stand there on equal footing. The fact that there are still at least 75 million people who are supporting this president shows that we have such work to do in this country and disproportionately that work falls to us. I just thought on that debate stage, we saw a different uh, Kamala Harris. I had the privilege to share a stage with her in 2019. I've spoken with her publicly and privately and you know, I think it's so long past due that we normalize what black women's leadership looks like. And she's doing that. I mean, she's got the wind in her back. I mean, she's in her bag, as the young folks say, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see it. I know a lot of people wanted her to go hard. You know, I certainly did. I wanted her to go hard on that debate stage. But 
what I would say about that is we have to remember when, um, as Vice President Harris, hopefully soon to be President Harris, when she speaks, she is not just speaking to the people in that room. She's also not just speaking to America. She is on the global stage. She is speaking to President Xi of China. She is speaking to Modi of India. She is speaking to um, all kind of global leaders ac across this country. And she had to show that she's the adult. Um, and, you know, I thought she did that beautifully, quite frankly. So I was Im impressed uh, with her performance, and I thought she hit every note uh, that she needed to hit. And the thing is, it's an unfair pressure on her because not only is she the candidate, but she has to be someone um, who operates as a journalist because our media is failing us. She has to inform constituents because cable news hosts are failing us. She has to be a campaigner um, on that stage and make her compelling case. I love that it was no audience and that you just heard from her. Um, you know, I think an audience probably would have, you know, I, I, think, I think clowns need an audience. You know, you need somebody to dance for. And I think leaders can command a room whether there's somebody in it or not. Uh, so I thought she just did a great job. So I know we're late. I know y'all talked about the debate, but I, a lot of you all asked, uh, how I felt about it. So that's how I felt about it. I'm excited. I'm enthusiastic, uh, about what November brings. I do wonder if the debate or the, uh, um, election rather will be decided that night. Um, there are a lot of, it, we may go to the courts. We may have some, some discord, uh, in some of these municipalities, uh, Georgia is now decidedly a purple state. So, and we see the cheating attempting to happen. The election board here has made it uh, okay for anyone to challenge a, a ballot. So hopefully it will be a decisive victory where we won't have uh, any of those issues. So you guys tell me uh, what you think. Um, I will tell you there is no hotel in DC. Everything is booked. And so Joseka Edie, like we said, who runs Winning with Black Women, she has given people a charge. And she said, if you have a hotel room booked for inauguration, but you ain't registered nobody to vote, then you got to get your priorities together. You got work to do. So I'll leave that topic on that note. Arrive with five. And I hope that you all will be just as enthusiastic to cast the first vote for a black woman president as I am. All right, a lot of times people ask me, um, what do I read? How do I consume content? And so often somebody's asking me, um, oh, you didn't see this thing? It went viral on TikTok. Or, oh, you didn't see this thing? I reshared it on Instagram. And I have to be honest with you guys. Yes, I consume social media like all of you, but not, um, not overly, so I'm not addicted to it. And I have to say respectfully, because I know we're all guilty of this, but respectfully, social media is eroding our brains. It really is. The big news the past few months, it, it seems like every month Shannon Sharp has gone viral for something. I won't even get into what he's going viral for right now. Y'all probably already know. Um, but it just seems so often that the foolishness rises to the top. And I think of all the interesting things I consume on a daily basis. Um, I read about maybe eight to 10 papers every morning. A lot of people ask what I read, so I'll run through quickly. Um, I always read the Times first. A lot of people don't like the New York Times because of the political coverage, but their global coverage, their world section, their business section, their technology section, their education section, it's really interesting information. Um, it keeps me up to speed on what's going on. The Washington Post, The Economist, The Atlanta Journal-Constitution, I like to know what's going on locally. Um, the Atlantic has amazing think pieces. The New Yorker, amazing think pieces. Um, uh, BBC website. Uh, I like to, to, to consume global news because Western media has a very specific slant to it. Um, so Al Jazeera, um, I definitely read uh, Al Jazeera. Um, Dallas Morning News, I'll also tap into Dallas Morning News. LA Times, because I think there's a bias sometimes um, to East Coast media. I definitely like our niche media that centers our perspective. So the Grio, Michael Harriet does amazing work over there. Uh, the Root, um, I definitely read. Um, Financial Times to a lesser degree. I do uh, try to read the Wall Street Journal op-ed pages though. I, You know, the one thing I don't know a lot about is the markets and financial news, but the op-ed pages of the journal I do find um, very informative. I stopped watching cable news for obvious reasons, um, but I also um, will watch BBC News in the morning. I uh, try to find Al Jazeera content when I can. Um, Christian Amanpour and Company um, has a great show, PBS NewsHour. I just find I'm so much more informed, but I don't want 
y'all to think like I'm so highbrow that I can't get on social media. This is how Instagram keeps me addicted. If you've known me for five minutes or you've known me for five years, you know I love me a pit bull. I just think pit bulls are the sweetest, cutest, kindest dogs. Don't believe the hype. They are amazing dogs. And so every morning in between reading, I, um, because I'm addicted like all of you guys, I'll check uh, Instagram and I will look at puppy videos and dog videos. And the intention is to look for 15, 20 minutes and an hour will go by like that because I am so enthralled and consumed with watch, especially a puppy pit bull. I, I just, they're the most amazing dogs. So y'all don't care about this, but my brief little PSA that I do want to offer, please adopt, don't shop. There are so many pit bulls and shelters all across this country who need good homes and they're the most amazing animals. They're great with kids. Um, they're the easiest to train. They're Velcro dogs because they're so protective of their families. Um, they don't like being home alone. So make sure you have time um, to, to spend with them, but stop going to these breeders, you guys, like go to these shelters. Uh, tens of thousands of pit bulls are sadly euthanized every month. So when you're breeding pit bulls, it's hard for me to believe that you care about dogs. So that's the content I consume, but I'm, con I'm concerned about us consuming all this foolishness. I don't like it. Like everybody can tell me the latest celebrity gossip and, you know, Benifer is over again. And this was a big thing. And I just wonder, how many of those folks know what's happening in their local communities? You know, how many, um, can you tell me who your local congressman is? Are you registered to vote? Are you reading actual books? Are you, you know, aware of what's happening domestically and globally and, you know, our role in it as a country? And a lot of people always say, you know, um, I just feel like it's a, a constant phrase, especially among us. You know, if I was alive during the civil rights movement, I would be blah, blah, blah. Whatever you're doing right now, that's what you would have been doing during the civil rights movement. So if you're on your phone doom scrolling or scrolling through celebrity gossip and you're not actively participating in defending this democracy or contributing to your local community, um, I hope that we can find some sort of balance. Um, if you guys are reading something interesting, please let me know if there is an outlet that you go to that's a trusted source. Please let me know. I'm always looking to expand my diet, uh, of news and information books. I love books. One of my favorite books right now is black AF history by Michael Harriet. This book is my Bible. Okay. It is so good. You can't even read it in one sitting. What's so interesting about it is Michael Harriet, um, was homeschooled. So he never learned this fictional story of America. He didn't know that, you know, he never heard the story that Abraham Lincoln uh, freed the slaves. He didn't know the story that, you know, some nice white pilgrims rolled up on the Native Americans and they all got along great. Like he only learned the truth. And so he wrote that truth um, through his, that he researched, that he learned, that he was educated on and put it in a book. And it is just amazing. It not only changes how we feel about this country, most importantly, it changes how we feel about ourselves. And we are some goddamn superheroes. Let me tell you, America would not exist without black folks. So that's my reading recommendation. The next time you find yourself scrolling on TikTok or Instagram for hours, do yourself a favor and stop. Put a timer on that thing. Don't give it more than 20, 30 minutes. And then maybe use the rest of the 30 minutes or hour or whatever to read something interesting. And maybe you'll pick up that book because it's one of my favorites. Okay, I hear you. Is there anything positive about social media? Yes, I get it. Yes, of course there are things um, that are positive about social media. I think it has democratized who has a voice because so often we see we are summarily dismissed and silenced in mainstream outlets. And so, you know, if, if CNN or MSNBC um, is not centering content that is relevant to us, then yes, social media has democratized that process. And a lot of the reasons why we know what's happening in Kenya or in Gaza is because um, people have been brave enough to capture that imagery and post it on social media. So social media impacts democracy, um, and it certainly impacts how we consume news and information. I will say, though, please consume responsibly and please share responsibly. Just because someone has an iPhone does not a journalist make. So you do want to make sure that you're not spreading misinformation or disinformation. Um, and there, that kind of thing is specifically targeted to us. That's how powerful we are. They specifically target black folks and brown folks. There are a lot of um, Latino communities who are targeted specifically in Spanish language 
because a lot of these social media companies uh, and parent companies do not have enough native Spanish speakers to combat it. So shame on those companies. You need to hire more native Spanish speakers, but also shame on us if we are contributing uh, and doing the enemy's work for them. So yes, there are positive aspects to social media, but we just want to make sure that it's positive to our benefit. I'm also really exhausted with us giving so much of ourselves. We are just a bottomless bucket of dopeness and culture creation and defenders of the culture. And so often we put it out there and they take it and they make money off of it. So I just, I would love for us to find a way to harness the power of social media um, that is more beneficial to the community, not just enriching our pockets or not building brands, but building community uh, and enriching ourselves collectively. Uh, as a power of one. So I'm not just crapping on social media. I want you all to know I consume it too, um, but I try to not be addicted to it or glued to it. Okay, so another thing, you guys know that um, my entire cohort and I, a uh, group of uh, black women, all of us work in media, we take a trip every year. And this year we went back to Mexico. We call ourselves the Machetes. Um, so it's me, uh, Sunny Hostin, who is co-host of The View, Joanne Reed, who hosts the primetime show on MSNBC, The Readout, make sure you watch her show. Um, uh, Angela Rye, my co-host on Native Land Pod, Aaron Haynes, a brilliant, amazing journalist at the 19th. Um, Latasha Brown, who's doing amazing work uh, in the voting rights space. Alicia Garza, founder of Black Lives Matter. Brittany Packnett Cunningham. Um, you guys know Brittany. She's an activist. Um, this tent of Carrie Champion. Uh, ama I call her the catwalk assassin because I've never seen this chick look bad. Uh, she's tall, thin, looks like a model all the time. And Jamel Hill, of course, who you guys know, um, both of them from ESPN, uh, who's now doing her own thing and writing beautifully at The Atlantic and a lot of amazing things coming up from her. But... The 10 of us, we collectively take a trip every year. This year, uh, we went back to Mexico, had this amazing beauty. We go everywhere we go. We do not leave the property. We just spend time together. And I, you know, this podcast means so much to me because it centers black women. And I am so fortunate enough to have so many spaces and to be surrounded by black women um, where I can say what I want to say and it's a safe space. I know it won't leave where I can not be judged. You know, it's like I can exhale, I can breathe and we share so much with each other and, you know, we can talk money and salary and we can talk, you know, men and marriage and relationships and we can just all those things that, that exist with us with, within our lives. And it just means a lot to me. So I want to encourage you guys. Look, I, men are, I love men. I don't ever want anybody to be confused. I love, 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 love. Is this thing on? I love men. But there is nothing like time spent with my sisters. There, it is a feeling that no man can give me. It is sacred to me. And so I know, you know, a lot of you guys are madly in love, looking to be madly in love. Um, married for 10, 20, 30, 50 years, newlyweds, married for a few months. I just want you all to be encouraged to find that safe space with women because you put black women in a room. You could put 10 of us, you could put 10,000 of us in a room. If one person comes in that room who ain't of us, who don't look like us, the entire energy shifts. That's how powerful we are just collectively. I don't know y'all, but I know you. When I see you, I know you and you know me. You are me, I am you, I am yours, you are mine. I've told this story before, I'll, I'll tell it again briefly. I was on a flight um, and I always get choked up telling this story. I won't do it today. I always get choked up telling this story. I was on a flight and a black woman got on the plane and she, um, I don't know her. She was old, she looked old enough to be my grandma, not just my mother, but my grandmother. Um, and this is when I was still on air at MSNBC. And she stopped and she grabbed my face. Now, this is post-COVID. Like, touching somebody's face is real intimate. And she grabbed my face like this and lifted my head up and looked at me. And she said, oh, it is you. And she, um, I didn't know who she was, but she just looked at me and then just, like, patted my face and kept walking. And the magic of that moment, she knew my face was hers to touch. My face was hers to grab. I was hers, she was mine. She was my mother, my grandmother, my aunts, my friends, my sister, my cousin. That is the magic that exists among black women. 
And I felt so connected to this woman who I had never met. And I was so overcome by the feeling I wept. On the, I had to cover my face because if somebody had asked me, what's wrong, are you okay? I couldn't, I don't even know how to articulate what I was feeling except for this connection from this elder woman who just in that brief moment, I felt the love between us. And it is amazing how our love and our power can span across generations. Okay, I just want to say, because somebody is here with me being petty, um, <laughs> my executive producer was like, we just want to do a solo episode with just you. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that because that is a long time to be talking. You know, when you're on live TV and something goes wrong, you can feel like two or three minutes of air. I'm like, I don't have 30 minutes of content. So she's sitting here telling me, we're already almost at 30 minutes. And so she wanted me to come back on and tell you guys how I fought her and was resistant to doing this. And we just completed an episode with just me talking. So I hope y'all are not bored with this episode. Just listen to me talk. But I did want to at least try to answer some of the questions we've been getting, tell you what I've been up to, and tell you what you can look forward to uh, on the next few episodes of Across Generations. So thank you guys for indulging me. And thank you again for showing up here every week to listen to Across Generations. Also, please be sure to subscribe, tell your friends, share our content, like it, save it. You can find us on YouTube at Across Gen Podcast. Leave a comment on YouTube. I'm one of those crazy people. Now, this is where I do consume social media. When we drop a new episode, I do look at YouTube and look at all of your comments. I want the feedback. I want to hear what you guys enjoy, what you don't enjoy, what we can do better, what topics you want us to talk about. So please be sure to leave a comment on YouTube. You can follow me on uh, Instagram at Tiffany D. Cross. You can also follow us on Instagram at Across Gen Podcast. We are everywhere you are, everywhere you get your podcast. So please rate the show, rate, review the show. Rate it on our Apple podcast. We need you to help us keep growing. So thank you guys again, and we'll see you on another episode of Across Generations.